Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I wanted to continue the discussion of the philosophy of Ted Kaczynski by doing a whole video on this very important section, which not only opens the uh, Unabomber Manifesto, but actually closes it too. And it's not a coincidence that he both begins and ends the manifesto with a lengthy warning and critique about leftism, which I think deserves a full video to sort of unpack. Now, I just want to uh, begin the video by saying that obviously Kaczynski does not uniquely critique leftism in the sense that he's not like coming um, speaking from a conservative standpoint. He also uh, critiques the conservative movement of the 1990s in which the uh, lamenting that traditional family values um, have uh, broken down, traditional religious values have broken down, is actually paired in the uh, sort of 1990s establishment Republican mindset with refusing to let economic growth um, disappear, or refusing to let technological innovation continue to pave the way supposedly for more economic growth. So he does critique the conservative movement, at least as it was formulated in the 1990s through like the establishment Republican Party, and yet he um, devotes only a, a minute fraction of the time to critiquing the conservative movement compared to the lengthy critiques that he levels against the leftist movement. And in fact, he mentions that the most certain way to sort of kill his movement is to um, have it be absorbed by just another leftist, um, uh, to become just another issue within the leftist movement. And I'm just making sure that the uh, video is streaming since yesterday, the uh, video did cut out. So it would be intellectually dishonest, I think, for anyone who's actually read Kaczynski's work to say that he's not deeply invested in making sure that his movement does not simply get absorbed into this bigger thing called leftism, the way that other things like environmentalism have. Environmentalism on its face um, should not have anything intrinsically to do with, especially the Democrat Party. Um, environmentalism should be a realization that polluting um, the earth and burning through immense amounts of fossil fuels um, is, is a bad idea. And yet it got absorbed into the Democrat Party, it got neutralized, and it became just another on a laundry list of dogmatic issues, which you recite the creed of purity to belong to the Democrat Party. You say, oh, of course, in addition to, uh, to gay rights, um, I'm also in favor of environmentalism, and yet not, you don't have to do anything to actually prove that. You obviously still have your frequent flyer miles, and you have your mansion if you're Al Gore, and obviously you have all of these sort of international vacations to exotic locations um, if, you're, if you're any one of these politicians. And that's exactly what Kaczynski fears could happen all too easily with the anti-technological movement. It might just be another on a laundry list of of things that you recite on the creed to belong to the Democrat Party. And that's why he devotes considerable attention to distancing himself from um, the leftist movement. But if you're watching this as a liberal, you might respond to that by misunderstanding what exactly it is that he's critiquing. And that's why I wanted to do this video with the slideshow to clarify those things. So first of all, when he talks about leftism, he's not talking about particular flesh and blood individuals, although much of what he said will still overlap incidentally with, with those types of people. So he's not just critiquing the set of individuals who belong to a political ideology, many of whom are, you know, decent people and, you know, sort of going along with the movement, whatever, um, just as it would be the case with the other side as well. Um, what he's talking about is also not this or that particular hot button issue. So um, if you're in a debate about um, the, the uselessness of leftism and um, you have a liberal maybe respond to that by saying, well, what about this or that hot button issue like the Iraq war? Are you saying you're in favor of the Iraq war? Well, obviously not. You know, Ted Kaczynski is highly critical of wars for oil, just like I am, but that does not make you into a leftist. Or they might bring up global warming. Well, well what about global warming? Um, well, obviously, that's an issue which should have nothing. The, the Democrat Party shouldn't pretend to have ownership of things like global warming, which are you know, a very real problem for the whole world, especially as a result of you know somebody like Al Gore uh, flying all over the earth to try to warn us about how bad it is to fly all over the earth. So he's not talking about this or that hot button issue. Um, he's talking mostly actually about a psychological type, and I'll get to that in greater detail in a little bit. Now, I want to just start by talking about the way that the Manifesto, Industrial Society and its Future, written in the 1990s, um, not coincidentally, both 
both opens and closes with this warning about the dangers of leftism. Now, obviously, if you have your own copy, section 6 to 32, which is right after the sort of introduction of the document as a whole, sort of takes us through this critique of the psychology of the leftist as a type before he gets to all of the other warnings, um, which are so famous in there. And then he closes as well with the warning that um, getting sort of reabsorbed into the leftist movement is something which not only would destroy his own movement, but which would sort of a priori rule out even the goal of phasing out technological intermediation. Um, it, would, it would fail at that goal because um, the leftist movement in the past has tended to oppose things while they were in the minority, but once they got power, they quickly changed their mind about it. And the, the, the immense power of technology would be simply too great for an organized, um, dominant leftist party that actually seized control to, to just throw away and so they would change their mind about that just like the uh, Soviets did with things like censorship or the things like secret police. Anyway, in um, his early work, it's very important, but it's also something that occupies a lot of his attention all the way to like the later work like Anti-Tech Revolution. If you have your own copy, page 96, he mentions that Earth First started as a sort of politically neutral um, critique of the kind of senseless environmental damage, which once again, the Democrat party should have no claim to ownership on that issue. But what happened was because it was a radical movement, it you know gained momentum and other leftist types noticed that there was a movement over there and they kind of migrated over there. And then enough of them swung the movement that they just by power of majority um, and you know what's the word group think, if that's the right word, they just sort of morphed it into another sterile leftist um, movement on a laundry list of other issues. And that's exactly what Ted Kaczynski seems to be deathly afraid of happening to his own movement. So it would be intellectually dishonest, regardless of whether you yourself are a liberal or a conservative, it doesn't matter for this video. This is a video about how it would be intellectually dishonest to downplay the many explicit ish, uh, warnings that he has about this issue. And therefore he mentions that it's fundamentally incompatible with the leftist movement. It's not just that you need to maybe go into the leftist movement and like tinker with it until it becomes compatible. There's an a priori incompatibility between the two. And that's what I want to talk about in this video. So political revolution, you mentioned that the game is not enough. Political revolution means, you know, literally just changing who's in office. So the political revolution of Obama just put a different guy in the presidency and very little beyond that changed. And that's not the kind of revolution they saw in there because like economics and um, technological um, issues are um, prior to merely political issues. And let me just make sure that, yeah, okay. So, hey, Griffin, how you, how you doing? So, um, so uh, the, the notion in Kaczynski's work that there is a sort of hierarchical um, there's a type of hierarchical framework in which politics and economics and technology are not just all three on the same level plane in which there's this type of concatenating relationship where you have a list where there's, there's politics, but then there's also economics. It's not like that. If you're talking about politics in a certain sense, you're really talking about economics. Um, he means that in a very different way than Marx, obviously, but, um, and arguably Marx was talking much more about politics, despite the fact that he claimed to be going all the way to the economic base. There's really no uh, substantial difference between the communist way of wastefully burning fossil fuels to do environmental damage in order to grow the economy, except for the political aspect of which parties in control and how is power divided within society. Actually, economically, um, communism is equally invested in technology. In fact, um, Dmitry Orlov grew up, uh, who was born in the Soviet Union, said that um, a lot of the uh, lip service to uh, science and technology that Americans think is uniquely theirs, you'll find the same thing in the Soviet Union. In fact, a lot of um, scientists um, in the United States and like the, during the Cold War would um, get uh, copies of Russian scientific papers and laboriously translate it into English so they could plagiarize the results. So um, certainly the idea that politics um, as, you know, as, as um, related to economics in the way that there's a hierarchical relationship in which you can't just change the politics without changing the economy is something that's much more seriously taken, I think, in Kaczynski, even than it is in Marx. But anyway, I'll unpack, uh, unpack the, the notion that there's this type of leftist psychology rather than a bunch of individuals or just a set of hot button issues, which is he's concerned with. So for him, the leftist is not so much a person like, say, Al Gore 
or um, Anna Kasparian or Jane Huber or whoever. Um, although incidentally, they might overlap. For him, he's really talking about psychological type. Now that's kind of an ambiguous term. I think one um, analogy which is useful is that for John Calvin, the great sort of Protestant reformer, the Bible is to be read typologically. Now, you know, we tend to think in the 20, 20th and uh, 21st century that Protestantism is about fundamentalist readings of the Bible, which is like a literal interpretation. Like it says six days, it must be six days. That's kind of a 20th and 21st century way of reading the Bible. In Calvin's era in, in the Renaissance, it was more typological. So you have this type like the reprobate, which might be sort of, um, instantiated in different areas within the Bible, but rather than reading Ahab through the literal lens of, well, that was just a king in, you know, that year in the ancient era who got killed because he tried to fool God or whatever. Um, he tried to, you know, put on a disguise to avoid his fate. That's why Captain Ahab in Moby Dick restages that. Well, you, it's not just that um, you have the literal interpretation of a historical event. You also have the typological interpretation that Ahab is the same type of reprobate that you find in the book of Romans talking about people who hear the voice of God but shut themselves off to it and that God gives them up to a reprobate mind in a laundry list of you know sins, quote unquote, follow from that. And you, you have two instantiations of the same basic biblical type in there. And something like that is going on here where he's talking not just about one particular person or a group of people, he's talking about a certain psychological type. And this is, um, something which is anonymous and formal enough that simply on formal grounds, this is incompatible fundamentally with the kind of work that he's doing, regardless of which people are involved. So this incompatibility um, it stems from the psychological problems of feelings of inferiority and over-socialization. So feelings of inferiority or things like the way that in political correctness, you have this psychological need to project offense even into language which is either not intended to be offensive or actually just flat out not offensive at all in the way that political correctness is all about constantly changing the terminology once you find that a certain term is now offensive even if that term was recruited to be a, to to be a euphemism for another term that was even more offensive before so for example it got to the point where he mentions in the 90s that you can't even say the word handicapped um, and I can think of worse words, more offensive words than handicap. That seems like a euphemism to me. But because of the need to find offense, you have to change handicap to locomotively challenged. And I'm sure that by now, locomotively challenged is also considered offensive. And this doesn't stem from an objective um, recognition that that language actually is offensive. It's stemming from this type of psychological need to have conflict, which though this type of obsession with proving that uh, obs obsession with trying to prove that the inferior groups are not really inferior in the case that Zizek mentions in Europe, the politically correct multicultural um, intellectual is obsessed with appeasing the, um, the, the quote unquote Muslim fundamentalist in you know, some area in the Middle East by saying, oh, don't worry, we don't look down on your culture. We don't consider ourselves to be more advanced and carrying on the colonialist um, uh, project of uh, of oppressing um, the uh, the Middle East, uh, and that actually enrages the guy from the Taliban in um, Pakistan even more. It's this kind of vicious cycle, which will still go on because needing to project um, um, the type of conflict which might not even be there, and the succession with trying to say, "Well, I don't have those thoughts," actually betray that you're the one who's actually caught up in having those thoughts about that person, and therefore. There's something other than what he calls the cool-headed logician at work here. The cool-headed logician kind of just um, observes things on an objective level. But the, um, the psychology of leftism is hostage to the type of irrational psychological drive for power. And it's that which is actually at the base of the obsession with relativist philosophy, which is fashionable in the 1990s in the academy, this idea, well, nothing's actually above anything else, there's no objective truth. That's actually betraying the drive for power, which for which that would be merely instrumental. And let me just make sure real quick that the camera is still showing the image because like I said yesterday, the, um, 
the uh, the camera cut off towards the end of my discussion with Flowers of Love. So this idea of feeling inferiority um, shows that a need for aggressive confrontation is something which, even if they could accomplish the same goal without going through that path, they would find it kind of dissatisfying. There's the um, myth of the pathological gambler who um, can't resist his temptation to go into a competition with a prize of, say, $10,000 and he um, gets into serious financial trouble because he can't control um, the impulse to try to gain that much money and gets himself uh, into all kinds of trouble. But Pascal noted that even if you were to give the pathological gambler the prize money um, in total without having to gamble, he would actually be kind of disappointed. Like if you were to give him the money without letting him go through the gambling process, he would find it as a disappointment because his motivations are more psychological than simply based on the sort of teleology of achieving that goal. You find the same thing with the liberal movement in the sense that the need for aggressive confrontation betrays that even if Sean King could, for example, get the kind of racial equality he claims to want without having to go through confrontation, he would actually be fairly disappointed. And not only does he need that confrontation to exist for others, and as soon as there's a slight rumor that someone somewhere in the country was um, was disrespected. He has to share it with like a couple million people on Twitter immediately. He also needs himself to be involved in that confrontation. Sean King, who claims to be a, a, a black victim of racism, I'm not saying one way or the other, but it seems to me that he has a psychological need to be the victim and he has a psychological need for the racist so-called to really exist in which if he were to tomorrow get the exact society he claims to want with no confrontation, or he was no longer able to be this victim that he has apparently a psychological need to be, he would actually find it disappointing. He'd feel like somebody was uh, you know, robbing him of an activity that he had grown quite attached to. And that's the whole point because I'm making that this is at the end of the day, a surrogate activity, which is built more on a frustrated desire to go through the power process for which no matter how many reforms you actually succeed in accomplishing, it's never going to be enough. Um, you know, you get this social reform pushed through in the sixties, you get gay marriage passed in 2015 or whatever, and you're still never satisfied. You get a Christian baker fine, you know, $200,000. It seems in a lot of ways, like you're getting a lot of your agenda um, accomplished, and yet you're every bit as dissatisfied the next day as you were before then. And there's always the need for another arbitrary goal to be set up to the point of absurdity in which, um, because it's a combination of feelings of inferiority and over-socialization, as I'll explain in the next one, there's a type of inevitable loss of personal power, especially within um, being held hostage to a modern industrial technological system, which um, sort of a priori deprives people of being able to go through the power process in the first place. And that loss of personal power resurfaces in this pathological need for power that can only be satisfied for them with personal identification with some mass movement in which the more power that the leftist movement gets as a whole is the only way that this person can satisfy uh, the simultaneous problem of over socialization in which psycho in psychology socialization is being trained to think and act exactly as society demands you to and even though leftists claim to be in deep rebellion against society. In fact, they say, well, you know, we have, we have a racist and homophobic society and all of my activism is just this act of rebellion against it. In fact, what actually happens is the leftist is the most oversized, or over-socialized person within society because they go along with exactly what the um, university and media are telling them. And in fact, the myth that the system is not doing enough to educate people about racism, homophobia, and sexism is absurd when you go to any college campus where that's pretty much the only thing on the curriculum these days. I mean, we kind of just spent with not only learning any skills or anything like sort of difficult to theoretical, now you're pretty much just getting a degree for four years in social uh, justice activism. I mean, your degree at this point basically is just staying on street corners saying F Trump or whatever. And um, the myth that we have to, um, rebel against the society by reiterating everything that the media and the intellectual elites are already saying. And the, the myth simultaneously that an Ivy League six-figure salary professor is uh, somebody rebelling against, at, at this case, literally the socialization of a racist society. Well, he's actually the most over-socialized 
uh, within society um, is exactly the kind of contradiction with which Ted Kaczynski um, is, uh, has the guts to observe, which most people don't. So he also mentions that leftism overlaps with the system to an extent that few leftists can appreciate. For example, they claim to want to preserve, say, black culture. But for them, that means little more than allowing trivial consumer, com consumerist habits like uh, black food and black music is his own example to fit within a certain market niche. And it turns the culture, therefore, just into a, a type of uh, niche within the list of products that you can sort of fill. You can get your Indian food, for example, at the local Indian uh, uh, restaurant or, or grocery store, whatever. But what they really want is for everybody to follow the same path of integration into the system, which they is the most over-socialized people have followed themselves. Um, they want them to be, an, everyone to be another six-figure salary professional. They want you to be a lawyer, a doctor, corporate drone, university professor. And therefore, there's an equivocation between the kind of freedom which they seem to allow in unessential factors, like what kind of music do you like, what kind of food do you eat, and which is really just permissiveness versus the type of complete lack of freedom that you have in anything that's actually essential. Um, the system allow, uh, allows no wiggle room uh, in, in, in contrast to the type of dogmatic obedience that you have to have to all of the essential factors of how that society is going to be configured as an over-technologically -technolo mediated society in which everybody has to fit into this professional social role in order to exist. And that's something that you will not find the leftist movement actually critique. And therefore, leftism has to be understood within the context of the power process in that if you have this combination of over-socialization with the type of feeling of inferiority, which is really sort of built on this need for aggression in the sense that if a protest were to miss out on the aggressive or confrontational part of it and be purely peaceful, a lot of people would actually just be um, disappointed. I mean, I remember when Trump was running for president, the, the protests where there wasn't violent action by the cops were kind of disappointing. It was those protests where people got pepper sprayed or where somebody um, you know, got forcibly removed by the cops and got bruises, that actually satisfied their expectation for meeting that confrontation. And then obviously they gleefully shared that you know, millions of times over social media, which shows that like the gambler who wouldn't take the money without being able to gamble, they wouldn't be satisfied if they couldn't have that type of aggressive confrontation. And what you have when you combine over-socialization with feelings of inferiority, in a modern society that deprives you of the power process anyway, you have this sort of, sort of perfect storm or time bomb where you have, um, by being deprived, being able to go through goal, effort, success, and freedom, as I mentioned, power process in other videos, you have this um, time bomb where you have leftism become nothing more than a surrogate activity which substitutes for the power process in a way that can never be satisfied. Because you're not allowed to go through the power process for things that actually matter, which you know pretty much can be satisfied. Like if you're a hunter gatherer going through the power process to try to get enough food in the form of hunted you know, rabbits or wild roots to, to not starve, there is a type of satisfaction of that goal in which once it's accomplished, you can pretty much be content with empty space, uh, spaces of time afterwards to do nothing, which would become boredom for the type of frustrated uh, person caught up in our society. But Tixon mentioned when he was living as literally a hunter-gatherer, he didn't really experience boredom because there was a clear sense of completion of the process, which you never get to have. Um, and even more so if you're caught up in the leftist type of surrogate activities for which after one goal is won, another must immediately be set up. I remember when gay marriage was debated for you know decades, it seemed that if they could only get that, they'd be satisfied. Well, it's been like, what, four years since I was passed, and there's no shortage now of other things that came in to fill the, um, the, the role of the, the goal to show. So this shows that the drive for power is something with, with vast precedence over the content of any particular goal, and it's intellectually dishonest to therefore equate leftism with any one of those with any one of those particular issues, as I mentioned at the beginning of presentation, um, you know, a leftist bringing up, well, what about the Iraq war? Well, obviously, that's something which any rational person is going to oppose, just like global warming is something, you know, you pretty much have to acknowledge. Um, but to say that leftism is nothing but that particular goal is intellectually dishonest, because even if they could solve, you know, any one of those, they would just move on to something else, because the drive for power is going to remain 
unsatisfied. Therefore, the quote in the Lord of the Rings about we cannot use the Lord of the Ring because it's altogether evil. Its strength is too great for anyone to wield at will and uh, save those who already have a great power of their own. But for them, it holds an even deadlier peril because the very desire of it corrupts the heart. A scene where the meeting uh, about what to do with the ring where Boromir proposes, well, you know, we could just use the ring after, it has, after all it has this amazing power and, you know, it would be kind of useful to just defeat the enemy. It's something which Gandalf and the elves are wise enough to realize you can't even play that game. And this is something which leftists also fail to see with regard to the inherent danger of preserving technology and its whole in industrial infrastructure. And it's um, something which they might incidentally oppose as long as it's the other who controls it. So when Bush was doing NSA, you did have the sense that, you know, technological intermediations getting out of control because now Bush can tap your emails, which obviously, you know, was an unjust thing. But as long as it's merely framed as this pro this partisan issue of opposing something because the other controls it, or opposing it because you want to fit in with some movement you see over there, which looks like it's radical and it looks intuitively kind of like it might be some hippie leftist movement, you just join it on herd instinct. It's something which a rational rejection of technology um, as this inherently dangerous force, which if allowed to continue on its current path, is going to possibly make the earth uninhabitable in the sense that even things like air, as you know, seeming for the ancient Greeks to be just one undecomposable element along with earth, fire, water, etc., is something that we can't even take for granted now because the exact chemical makeup of air risks being destabilized to the point we lose breathing air. Uh, we lose water as a concept when it becomes so polluted um, by fracking and other things. Not to mention the you know lip service of people like Mark Zuckerberg to taking environmentalism seriously, while actually um, you know leading the path for the most um, environmentally um, taxing project of all, which is the type of modern computerized industrialism and World Wide Web, which he profits enormously from, also shows that if leftism really were uniquely compatible with the type of serious critique of technological overshoot, you would expect the most liberal areas of, say, the United States to be leading the way for opposing it. And what you, what you actually find is you go to Facebook headquarters, you'll find lip service to things like, you know, environmentalism, and, you know, climate change and, and, and pollution and whatever, by the same people who are leading most of that. And um, it just shows that after gaining power, they will quickly change their mind about technology as now no longer being something that the other party controls, or now no longer just being a rebellious movement on the ground for them to sort of join in with to take selfies. It will be something which they'll quickly change their mind about and embrace because the tremendous power and usefulness that it embodies is something that can satisfy the drive for power and also the trend towards collectivization, which is an inherent part of leftism in the sense that the solutions proposed by leftism as, as a response to a personal sense of powerlessness within modernity that can only be satisfied um, within the bounds of over-socialization fitting into your prescribed role by having a mass movement. And of course, the mass movement needs to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And obviously anyone on a college campus who says one thing slightly out of line with that will be publicly shamed to the point probably that they have to leave the campus, which shows that these, the collectivization of leftism taking over the whole university um, is not incidental. It's a natural outcome of the particular combination of psychological factors, which he mentions. And of course, that collectivization is not merely in a vacuum. It's actually a euphemism for the type of industrial society we have today in which you can only maintain the type of global collectivization that we currently have if you're also using, um, let me just see the comments uh, real quick and just respond to these. Um, perfectly happy with Facebook and YouTube censor censorship. Of course, of course they're okay with uh, Alex Jones being censored, but any number of, you know, um, people saying um, much more um, dangerous uh, things that they can't critique, you know, like there was a jihadist in Syria who was using Twitter to actually make threats. And it's not like 
you know, like an empty thread. It was actually like a serious thing. And he was allowed to stay on Twitter because they did, they did not, they would rather ban um, Alex Jones selling like kind of shady, like pharmaceutical, um, like uh, herbal products than they would. So that would get you into more trouble than being a jihadist in Syria, making credible threats um, on the ground level. And um, I'll have more to say about that in a moment. But um, the, the idea that the kind of collectivization which they require for psychological needs in the sense it's not enough for them just to be the single individual with all the right ideas. They only have those right ideas as an effort to be part of this movement, which has to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And um, the, the kind of collectivization we're talking about requires um, rapid transportation networks. It requires um, mass uh, telecommunication networks. It requires, at this point, the internet. It requires all of these things, which in addition to burning immense amounts of fossil fuels, uh, immense amounts of fossil fuels, which are doing exactly the kind of environment damage they claim to oppose, it's also something which you cannot um, maintain without the kind of technology which negates the entire purpose of Kaczynski movement. And the uh, idea that um, past trends of how leftists have acted might uh, correct mistaken assumptions about that. It's something that if you actually looked at the Russian communists, for example, they opposed censorship until the right to censor became their own. Um, they opposed the secret police until they were working for them. And leftist professors, when they were kind of the minority, like after World War II, um, they supported academic freedom, right? Until they became the dominant group. And they could now rephrase the loss of other people's academic freedom under the euphemism political correctness. And because leftism is more of a psychological type defined passively by over-socialization and feelings of inferiority and defined actively by the drive for power and the trend towards collectivism, there's no single issue that could take precedence within the movement and clarify its goals like opposition to technology. The big thing in anti-tech revolution is that in order for the movement to succeed, you have to have one goal. It's not like, you know, the liberal movement today, which if you pull one of your, your good liberal friends over and say, well, what is liberalism? They'll probably rattle off a long list of issues like, well, you know, it's being in favor of a, a gay marriage and it's also being opposed to the Iraq war. And it's also being opposed to uh, a global warming and in capitalism, and uh, it's being in, in, in favor of uh, minority rights, and, and whatever. I mean, that, that might be true, but it's a laundry list of issues, and some things end up very far down the list in the sense that, you know, um, if you watch The Young Turks, Kasparian and um, Cenk and Cenk Ewer, they'll occasionally critique the fossil fuel industry. So it's not that fossil fuels are nowhere on the laundry list, but it's so far down that they'll only bring it up if there's an explicit news story about giving more government funding to clean energy. And they only bring it up, by the way, if the solution is implicitly to keep the entire infrastructure running on wind turbines, solar panels, or some other, you know, bullshit sort of uh, solution, which actually isn't going to work. And therefore, if somehow critique of technology did find its way onto the laundry list, it would be so far down that at that point it would become irrelevant. And if opposition to technology were incidentally, um, uh, actually, I just mentioned that, never mind. Um, so just think of Bill Gates, um, somebody who actually considers himself to be a dogmatic liberal philanthropist. So he's not just in his own mind, some evil rich guy who's kind of, you know, um, hoarding his money for his own purposes. He really sees himself as a philanthropist using his wealth to advance um, humanity. And obviously he takes trips to Africa where he gets the photo op of, you know, descending into the heart of darkness, quite frankly, is how the media and he himself consider it to go all the way into the heart of darkness to, uh, you know, take on the white man's burden, which he himself <laughs> probably claimed to oppose of, of bringing liberal um, um, uh, progress to them. What does that liberal progress actually amount to? Bill Gates, beside, behind this facade of philanthropic social justice, actually the one doing all of the irreparable environmental damage, which this or that photo op is trying to, to put out fires, which he himself is igniting on the entire global scale. And the question which I posed a little earlier, which is if leftism is uniquely compatible as a solution to the problems of um, 
technological overshoot and at a more mundane level, just environmental damage. Like if leftism was uniquely suited to uh, fix environmental damage, why is it exactly that the most liberal centers in the country, like the San Francisco Bay Area where you have Facebook headquarters, um, or like Seattle, quite frankly, where you have um, Microsoft and Amazon headquarters, why is it that the most dogmatically liberal areas within the country are exactly the ones that are responsible for much of the environmental destruction which we're currently witnessing. And I think that this has something to do with linguistification, which is kind of my own term from a video I did on Aristotle in which, you know, with the linguistic turn like the 1960s and deconstruction, you get tempted to think that, well, everything is language. But that's kind of a new attitude, which is at odds with, you know, the much more modest location that language had, say, in the ancient era, in which for Aristotle, you can sort of use language to represent these other things which are already meaningful. There's a type of isomorphism between a linguistic message formed with words and this other thing which is intuitively understandable. He's not saying that that isomorphism doesn't exist. He's just saying that you run into the risk of, um, of um, sort of essential blurring if you think that the essence of um, understanding things um, intuitively is the same as the essence of using words to talk about them. And something um, also uh, out of uh, balance between the two is that with linguistification, you're much more susceptible to bullshit. Um, it's much easier to fall into bullshit if you're merely using language than if you're um, embodying meaning in some other um, uh, some other medium. And in anti-tech revolution, Kaczynski repeatedly warns that the movement has, must have one clear goal. Ideology is a tool to promote the message. So there is this isomorphism between an ideological linguistic statement and the message, okay? But it does so only incidentally. And he warns that if you get too caught up in the mere linguistification, you run the risk of getting into arguments which nobody outside the most dogmatic speculative thinker within the movement is going to care about, and you'll alienate anyone outside the movement. Therefore, the goal itself is something, I think, more formal than linguistic. But what you have with leftists is a radical over-linguistification in which the trend towards dogmatic ideology, which has to be phrased in words, um, has been taken to the point of absurdity in, in the sense that, you know, you hear stories about people being stopped, um, you know, on college campuses and basically interrogated. Like, I remember when I was on um, the college campus 10 years ago, there would be people waiting at the doors, like a crowd of 10 people with signs and clipboards waiting at the doors. They were leftist activists and they would stop you on your way out of class um, and say, do you support clean energy? And, you know, I'll be honest with you, I don't. I don't support solar panels because solar panels are a scam that doesn't actually produce any new energy. It merely stores fossil fuel energy because the amount of energy it takes to produce one solar panel in fossil fuels for the total cost is about the same as the amount of energy that that solar panel will, will harvest over its lifetime. It's actually um, a, a, just a transfer of fossil fuel energy. But if you're on a college campus today, you can't say that. You can't say I'm not in favor of clean energy because there are sort of um, agents standing at the door with a clipboard trying to bully you into putting your name on a list to try to, you know, get the signatures to ram something through Congress to um, get more funding for solar panels. And the type of um, insistence on having everybody interrogated on linguistic grounds uniquely where you have to say the right words. Okay? You have to say the words not only with the right message, but with the, the currently politically correct terminology in the sense of this obsession with language that you find in which, you know, um, Native Americans is now a politically incorrect term. Okay, so there was this hot shot from Yale who came to my campus when I was an undergrad talking, lecturing us about how um, obviously you can't say Indians, you can't say American Indians because that um, is also politically incorrect because obviously they're not they're not Indians, which you know, as somebody who lives in India right now, I'll acknowledge that's not a very good term. But you also can't say Native Americans because Native American has this teleology that even before you know the the, the white settlers crossed the ocean in in the Renaissance, they were already Native Americans. So there's this teleology inherent there where you're already assuming that they're just waiting to be discovered by the white man. And there's I guess some merit on a rational grounds to that. But the question of well, what do you call them then? Because you know, those are the only terms currently which people who are not 
um, up to their eyeballs in consuming you know, tweets from guys like him won't know the right terminology. And one thing which I actually kind of agree with Alex Jones is that this obsession with making terminology obsolete is not strictly motivated by this desire to actually um, promote the interests of the people you're claiming to. It's rather built on making sure that people who aren't grandfathered into the social justice movement will not have the right terminology. In the sense that if you're not following 25 Twitter pages that are telling you the currently right term, you're going to see the wrong term. And you see this with people in America who grew up in the 50s. They might use a politically incorrect term, which makes the hairs on the back of your head stand up, you know, if you've been on a college campus recently. But they're not really doing it intentionally. They just grew up in an era where that was the term. And if they're not currently following campus politics, like your professors the same age are following it, if they're not following it, they'll appear to be malicious when, in fact, they're simply out of date with the trend, but this entire tendency to obsess over having the correct words in order to formulate the correct dogmatic ideology in which you not only have to have the right words on one issue, but you have to have the right words on all the issues. And the attack right now on Tulsi, Tulsi Gabbard, if I have her name right, um, you know, somebody who might run for president for the Democrats next year about, well, in the late 1990s, she said something to the effect that she wasn't 100% behind gay marriage, and people are pulling that out from past from 20 years ago to say that on one issue, you should disqualify her from the, the movement because on a laundry list of like 50 issues, one of them is enough to, um, to get you booted from, from the movement. And obviously a lot of that is self-interested. The people who are trying to boot somebody else from the, uh, the, the, the front runner position are not doing it simply because they care so much about that issue. Um, it's more like an opportunity to seize the power which that person looks like they might get, which you would much rather have for yourself in the same way that in the Byzantine Empire, for example, it became a chronic problem to have people poison their own relatives to get the throne. Let's just say the current king is your brother. Yeah, I mean, even Hamlet, right? Yeah, Hamlet is recycling this. I mean, you see the same thing in the leftist movement right now. As much as they claim to be uniquely defined by compassion and love and whatever, um, you have the same sort of all too human desire to boot some person out of power or to get it. And a lot of the social justice movement is the realization that, you know, social power is like cocaine. You know, it's highly addictive and it's very hard to get off of it. Um, once you once you get a taste of it and the desire to get more and more and more power by having the ethical upper hand through having the right ideological words to disqualify somebody who says Native American, which is politically incorrect, or whatever, is simply too powerful and betrays the incompatibility with, of course, resisting the most powerful thing ever put on the earth, which is the full techno-industrial system, which burns immense amount of fossil fuels to um, uh, piggyback on centuries worth of, of, of engineering and scientific accomplishments to have these machines, which today are so powerful that, um, you know, you're really kidding yourself if you think that, you know, the, the outcome of, you know, like Anna Kasparian or, or Jane Huber, they have this wet dream that someday the whole world is going to be just like them. And then we'll have the ability for, um, quite frankly, somebody to come in and have wield immense power. And that's something which technology will be not only the only means for them to to do it, but also something which people who are driven by this need for power anyway um, will not be able to resist. So we have some comments here. So you have um, a shift in words to where I guess even people of color now is probably incorrect to some people. Um, none of these were offensive at the time. That's right. Um, you, if you find the, the uh, I don't even know the right word, the, the African-American writers in, the, ref, in the, uh, the civil rights era, they were using the same terms to describe themselves. And it's, it just shows that like the need for a term to become obsolete is built much more on the social exclusion of people who are not totally within the movement. Um, in the same way that there's a, a great Soviet film um, from, who well, ironically enough, the Soviets are also an embodiment of what happens when leftists actually get their wet dream of, you know, having total power over a nation like the, the Soviet Union. But there was a Soviet film called The Party Card, I think, um, which is pretty obscure. I don't even think you can find it on YouTube with English subtitles. 
I think it's only in Russian, but um, it was it was about a guy who was a member of the, the, the party who, um, you know, uh, one day he had a nightmare that he lost his car. And he knew that if he lost his party car, he would be susceptible to the same sort of witch hunts, which he himself was gleefully leading on other people, you know, hauling them off to the gulag or the execution or whatever. Um, and he, he was afraid that if he lost his party card, the same thing could happen to him. And we, we, we kind of do have a party card today, which is on your Facebook, if it doesn't say, you know, as when I was in college, I would, I would see um, people write on their Facebook political um, beliefs, either liberal or very liberal or extremely liberal or Marxist or communist or whatever, that would be like their party card, you know, in which if, if somebody looked up their Facebook, they would know that they have their party card. And if you have something else slightly, you'll be in the same position as the guy in this film was. And this idea that the party card as a way of excluding people um, can easily turn back on you yourself is what something we're starting to see right now in the sense that some people who were sort of, you know, unproblematically grandfathered into the social justice movement, there's, there's starting to be a bit of a rebellion against them. There's starting to be some infighting within the movement, which is kind of absurd to watch. But if you, I'm not going to name names, but you probably know who I'm talking about in the sense that like, you know, the, um, the, the, the interplay of oppressor and oppressed roles, which somebody might get addicted to having the oppressed role, just like Sean King, if he were to get a DNA test tomorrow saying, oh, sorry, man, this whole time you thought you were black, looks like you're actually just 100% white. Um, he would be deeply disappointed. Um, because it wouldn't be enough for him to fight for the rights of other people who are minorities. He has to be a part of it himself. He has to be oppressed himself. He can't be one of those people, which is the oppressor. He has to be the victim of this, and it will never be enough. And Sean King leading a witch hunt about uh, against a, a, a white redneck in a pickup truck who supposedly killed a girl just because she was black, and then finding out that it was actually a gang member who himself was also black who shot this girl on accident when he was trying to carry out a drive-by shooting on someone else, was, I think, something which Sean King um, leading this witch hunt on an innocent man just because he was white, quite frankly, as politically incorrect as that is to say, um, and because he needed such a person to exist, he needed the, the white redneck boogeyman who kills a person just because they're black. He needs that person to exist in which when, when you, when you do finally find that person, you gleefully share it on social media because for psychological reasons, you need them to exist. And when it turns out that that person didn't exist, that guy was just a random man on the street who was um, incorrectly labeled as the, 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 the criminal in this case, it was something which I think for Sean King also, he not only needs that person to exist, he needs that person to be coming after him. And if Sean King found out tomorrow that he's not actually the object of all of this um, that he's critiquing, he would be deeply disappointed. And I guess that's where I will end this. And uh, thank you for watching.